Hi, it's Katrina. Gladiator tunnels. 2,000 years ago, men fought to the death in Rome's great Colosseum. But before the battles, these men had to get themselves ready. What a lot of people don't realize is that the Colosseum was also a training area. Behind the scenes was a gym, a training yard, and an entire underground network beneath the arena floor where the gladiators prepared themselves. Just to get to the fighting floor of the arena, gladiators had to move through these secret tunnels and then take an elevator up. That was when they were finally met by the roaring applause of over 70,000 spectators. Gladiators weren't the only ones who prepared themselves in the underground tunnels either. This was where the wild beasts were kept before they were sent to the fighting floor to be slaughtered. Animal handlers also hung out down here, and slaves worked to prepare weapons and armor. It was nearly as busy underneath the actual floor of the Colosseum as it was on top. The Caves of Longyu the Longyu Caves in China are considered by some to be the ninth wonder of the ancient world. This place can be found today in the Xijiang Province, a mysterious underground complex of tunnels and rooms that were carved by unknown hands thousands of years ago. What's truly mysterious about these caves is that there are no historical records in China that they ever existed. No one knows who built them, how they pulled off such an amazing task, or why they would do so in the first place. These caves were discovered accidentally in 1992, when farmers drained some nearby ponds. Suddenly, five separate caverns appeared along with 19 smaller caves. At first, everyone thought it was a natural wonder, but there are supportive pillars and imprints from tools and carvings. More recent research shows that each cavern has one entrance with a vertical shaft to collect rainwater that would then be directed by a small channel down into a water trap. Whoever dug out the caves had to remove somewhere around 1 million cubic meters of rock. And seeing as this was thousands of years ago, and ancient people didn't have anything more advanced than maybe stone tools and some metal, it seems almost impossible. Archaeologists are working on trying to figure out what technology was used to carve out the underground chambers, some of which are nearly 90 feet in height. It looks like everything could have been done with chisels of different sizes. Pottery found on the ground suggests the caves date back to around 2,000 years ago. Of course, since the ancient civilization here left nothing else behind that we have been able to find yet, some have suggested this could have been a secret Anunnaki construction project from when they visited Earth. A more likely scenario is that it was made by a group of ancient people we just haven't learned about yet. The Longyu Caves are still a huge mystery to scientists. The strangest part by far is that not a single mention of the caves can be found throughout recorded Chinese history. It's like nobody ever knew they existed, and yet the project to build them would have been huge. It would have taken many years and a massive amount of labor to complete. What do you think this place could have been for? An ancient quarry? A ceremonial site? Palace? Storage? Let me know in the comments below! The Cave Castle Pradyama is an underground cave castle hidden at the bottom of a valley in southwest Slovenia. Its entrance is halfway up a vertical cliff face at a height of around 400 feet. But even though it's so high up, it's also incredibly deep down. It was constructed sometime around 1202 by an insane group of builders who managed to tunnel straight through the cliff into a series of caves. The result is something both beautiful, captivating, and a little terrifying. Pradyama actually looks quite a bit like Bran Castle or Dracula's Castle in Romania, except that it's hidden deep in the recesses of a dark, dank cave. The most interesting story surrounding Pradyama involves the Baron Erasmus von Lug. He was a local hero who robbed the rich and gave to the poor like Robin Hood. But he had to flee to the castle in the 1480s after he killed the marshal of the imperial Habsburg court. The emperor was so angry that he ordered a siege on the castle, but Erasmus refused to leave. He was able to keep himself secure in the castle by using its network of secret underground tunnels to collect provisions and rainwater. The underground passages allowed him to get 13 miles away to the Vipava Valley to collect fresh fruit like cherries. But finally, after one year under siege, Erasmus met his match. 
It happened when he went to an outhouse on the third floor terrace. As he was using the outhouse, a cannonball came hurtling through the air and crushed him as he tried to relieve himself. And that was the end of the siege. Creepy New York There is a secret underground tunnel hiding beneath the New York City streets. It's called the Atlantic Avenue Tunnel, and most New York City residents have no idea they are walking over it during their everyday lives. The tunnel was constructed way back in 1844 by Cornelius Vanderbilt. It was the first attempt in New York at a subway system. But the tunnel was never finished. It was abandoned and workers capped the project off in the 1850s. Rumor goes that a group of Irish immigrants were told they had to work on Sundays by their British contractor, so they killed him and then buried him behind one of the walls. It's possible that the skeleton of that murdered man may still be hiding down there. What's really crazy is that the tunnel was completely forgotten about until the 1980s, over 130 years later. It was only discovered by a man who accidentally went down the wrong manhole and found himself in the abandoned tunnel. The city saw a way to make money from the mysterious underground system by offering tours to curious tourists. But the tunnels closed off pretty quickly after due to safety hazards, and to this day, it remains sealed off and restricted to public eyes. Abandoned Anderson Shelters All throughout Britain, there are abandoned Anderson shelters from the days of World War II. They have been there for 80 years, mostly collecting dust and many of them forgotten since their entrances are sealed. The few shelters that are still open are full of bugs, graffiti, foxes, and teenagers up to all kinds of shenanigans. Anderson shelters got their name from Sir John Anderson. He was the British Lord in charge of air raid precautions back in 1938. He devised a system of corrugated steel made to form a semicircular dome, and people could install them as shelters underground in the backyard. They were for everyday folk, to protect them from the German air raids and from a potential invasion by the Nazis. England was so worried about the bombs being dropped by Germany that they constructed over 2 million of these shelters and family yards. All these years later, many of them are still there. Londoners use them for storage, to host kids' parties, and some even use them as backyard garden offices. But many are still beneath the earth, covered in overgrown shrubs and dirt, to the point that homeowners don't even know that they're back there. The Secret Martini Bar one of the palaces belonging to the Queen of England boasts a secret underground tunnel leading to a cocktail bar. At least this is according to Richard Eden, one of the editors for a local British newspaper. He described a conversation he had with Jack Brooksbank, the husband of Princess Eugenie. Jack also happens to work as a brand ambassador for a tequila company. He says there is a tunnel that goes beneath the streets of London all the way from St. James Palace to Duke's Bar. What this means is that the Queen herself, as well as any other member of royalty hanging out at St. James Palace, has a discreet way to travel underneath the city of London to get to the swankiest cocktail bar for a thousand miles. But this doesn't mean the Queen is actually sneaking out and going there. In fact, no king or queen has lived in the palace since the 19th century, when Queen Victoria moved to Buckingham Palace. Still, St. James Palace is usually filled with royal bureaucrats. These days, it's probably them using the secret tunnel for their after-work drinks, if for no other reason than that they can. Pretty convenient. Secret Rooms Under Washington Avenue In St. Louis, danger lurks underneath the sidewalk of Washington Avenue. Derek Langeneckert knows the danger all too well. He was driving his forklift down Washington Avenue during the 2017 Rise Up Beer Festival when all of a sudden the sidewalk collapsed. He and his forklift tumbled into a cavern. Derek had been carrying a load of beer kegs for the festival. When he fell, so did the kegs, blowing up and scattering every which way. Derek himself broke his back from the fall and was stuck in the hospital in terrible agony. He is recovered now, but he almost died. Naturally, Derek sued the city. Throughout his lawsuit, he discovered that the city is actually hiding the fact that there are dozens of hidden rooms all along Washington Ave. The sidewalk is basically a suspension bridge. 
Even the hole that he fell through is only now covered with plywood and a concrete overlay. It's strong enough for pedestrians, but not for a forklift carrying thousands of pounds of beer. But just what are these secret rooms? They are hidden basements from the 1900s. Shopkeepers had little stores set up down here with glass ceilings to let in natural light. But underground shopping is a thing of the past, and all these basements have been neglected for over 100 years. The decay is real, and Washington Avenue is essentially hollow. It's at constant risk of totally collapsing, swallowing up anyone unfortunate enough to be walking up the street when that happens. Lost Nuclear Bunker In the 1950s, everyone was worried about a nuclear bomb being dropped somewhere and destroying everything. The United Kingdom was worried about being attacked by the Soviet Union, and so similar to the Anderson shelters in the 1930s, the government began to create bunkers. This time, they needed to build reinforced concrete bunkers underground that would survive a nuclear strike. These were significantly more robust than the backyard garden shelters I told you about. One of these bunkers was in the Essex countryside, three stories underground. It was linked directly to the Royal Air Force radar defense system to track and intercept any enemy assault. The bunker, which today is a secret tourist destination that most people don't know about, is 125 feet beneath the earth. The only way in is through what appears to be an ordinary bungalow. The bungalow was designed as a secret entrance so that nobody would know there was a nuclear bunker in the otherwise peaceful countryside. But this isn't the only one. Not far from the secret bungalow bunker, there is a railway station that opened in 1865. It was taken over by the official London Underground in 1949 right around the time that everyone realized nuclear war might be inevitable. It wasn't profitable, and almost nobody used it. And then it closed in 1994, just as the threat of war seemed to dissipate. Many people believe there is a secret underground bunker at the station that the government would have used to whisk people away to safety in the event of an attack. Tunnels under the floor A man in England was looking through photos of his family's estate when he came across something strange. Freddie Goodall is a 23-year-old property developer who lives in his family's mansion, which happens to be over 500 years old. When he was looking at old pictures of the house, he noticed a doorway he had never seen before in the library. He went to look for himself and realized there was a secret passage hidden behind a bookshelf. There was a door in the picture, but no door any longer. After a bit of fussing to figure out how to get behind the wall, he discovered a secret passageway leading to a set of underground rooms. This is some real bat cave kind of stuff. The tunnel led to a ladder, which descended to a huge room filled with cobwebs and spiders. It was a rabbit hole that continued into an even deeper sub-basement, more secret rooms, and too many secret passageways to count. Now Freddy had no idea any of this stuff existed. He did a bit of research and found out the secret tunnels were probably used by these servants of the estate hundreds of years ago. The tunnels allowed them to move throughout the property without getting in the way of the landlords. Seems like pretty extreme measures to take. Times sure have changed. Staten Island Iron Mines Between the 1830s and 1880s, over 300,000 tons of iron ore were mined on Staten Island. This iron ore was refined and used in some of America's earliest iron foundries, but there is almost no evidence left of the enterprise today. Most of the mines are flooded, all of them are abandoned, and the few that weren't filled in are now secret and hidden. One of the most important iron mines anywhere on Staten Island was at Todd Hill. Iron mining began here in the 1600s, with much of the landscape being shaped by the miners coming in and carving out the land to create strip mines. By 1880, open pit mines were being converted into underground mines, and there were horizontal shafts over 100 feet long. German and Irish immigrants, making about $1 a day, pulled somewhere around 12 tons of iron ore out of the earth every hour. But by 1881, the iron had gone dry. The entire area of Tot Hill had been completely drained and the mines were abandoned. There is nothing left today except secret shafts hidden underneath neighborhoods where houses cost upwards of a million dollars. 
One of the very last remnants of iron mining can be found on Richmond Road, but it's not a mine shaft. It's an old house built in 1684. David J. Tyson, the man who opened the iron mines on the hill way back when, used it for his personal home. And Ancient Sumerians and Pluto The ancient Sumerian civilization went extinct around 5,500 years ago, but during their great reign, they made some of the most impressive advancements of any ancient society. They had advanced laws that included jury systems, schools, practiced mathematics, and most interesting of all, they mastered astronomy. The Sumerians came thousands of years before the Greeks or the Romans, yet they seem to have had even more knowledge about the cosmos than the advanced societies that developed long after them. The Sumerians had a name for every planet. They knew about Mercury and Venus. They were aware of Mars and Jupiter. They even believed that there was once a planet called Tiamat that exploded and turned into the asteroid belt. They knew about Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and even Pluto. In fact, they called Pluto Gaga. Here is the reason that this is so shocking. Neptune, Uranus, and Pluto were not discovered until after the 1700s by modern telescopes. And and since no evidence has ever been found that any civilization prior to 400 years ago figured out how to make such powerful telescopes, it makes no sense that the Sumerians knew about Pluto. They would have literally had no way to view it with their eyes. This strange fact has led to lots of speculation. Some say the Sumerians did indeed create telescopes so advanced they could see deep into the stars. Others say they gained their knowledge of the solar system by communicating with alien visitors who came down from the heavens. What do you think was the source of this incredibly advanced knowledge? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear your theories. Manufacturing Twine Scientists have discovered the very tool that people from the Stone Age used to manufacture twine. You know, like rope. And while twine might not be as exciting as potential aliens or mysterious early knowledge of Pluto, it was still a huge leap forward and a massive technological development. The tool comes in the form of a mammoth tusk. It was carved 40,000 years ago by an ancient human ancestor in order to create primitive rope. The tusk was discovered with four holes drilled in it, lined up perfectly, and marked with spiral incisions. Researchers were originally unsure what the instrument was used for when it was found in Germany. They theorized it could be part of a musical instrument or an object used for religious ceremonies. But scientists have finally figured out how our ancestors used it to weave plant fibers through its holes twisting and manipulating until they had made rope and twine. The four holes of the instrument were used to keep plant fibers in place. By weaving them together, they created ropes for fishing nets, bows, and snares and traps. These strong fibers could even be used to create clothing and pull heavy objects. Keep in mind this was almost 50,000 years ago, making it one of the first great technological inventions in human history. The Oldest Sunglasses On the remote Baffin Island in Canada, a place rarely seen by many because it's so far in the frozen north, something amazing has been found. Researchers discovered what they believe could be the oldest pair of sunglasses in the world. They were fashioned by the Arctic Inuit to keep the snow glare out of their eyes while moving across the frigid wasteland. The Sunglasses may not be too stylish by our modern standards, but they were certainly useful 2,000 years ago. They were created from a single piece of ivory, made to fit the face snugly with thin slits to see through. The glasses protected the wearer from snow blindness during the bright spring sunlight that reflected off the ice and snow. Without these glasses, just walking around was like staring directly at the sun. The Inuit who left these glasses behind were from the unique Thule culture. Researchers believe they traveled from the coast of Alaska all the way to the deep Canadian wilderness around the year 1200. And while many different types of sunglasses or snow goggles were made by the ancient people of the north, this particular pair seems to be the oldest. Other snow goggles were built from leather, while others were made from wood. It didn't really matter as long as they protected the user from going blind in the snow. The first gold. We're always talking about gold artifacts from ancient Egypt, Rome, and the civilizations of South America. But one of the biggest mysteries for archaeology is trying to figure out where gold was first used as a precious metal and why. The oldest date anyone has for the discovery of gold is in 2600 BC in ancient Mesopotamia. Researchers believe these were the first people to create gold jewelry. 
Just over 1,000 years later, in the year 1223 BC, precious gold was used in the construction of Tutankhamun's tomb. But researchers continue trying to learn why people in Mesopotamia suddenly found gold so important. Sure, it's shiny and now it looks valuable, but it's crazy to think somebody dug it out of the ground and said, hey, that would make a great necklace. Either way, the oldest traces of gold being used in jewelry date back about 4,700 years ago, and the fad has never died. The first gold coins were manufactured in 700 BC, and that was really the birth of money. In 564 BC, the Lydian king Croesus established the first international gold currency. It was around this time that gold was being excavated all throughout the Mediterranean and Middle Eastern regions. Aristotle was philosophizing about gold, mines were being made, at every gold vein, and everyone on Earth was scrambling to get their hands on the precious yellow material. Prehistoric New York Archaeologists in Israel have discovered the original New York City. Mind you, it's nowhere near modern New York City. It's all the way on the other side of the planet. Researchers say the ruins of the city represent a metropolis once home to over 6,000 people. There were ritual temples, fortifications, planned roads, and neighborhoods. It dates back 5,000 years though something even older was found beneath it. Underneath the ruins of the city, Israeli archaeologists found traces of an earlier settlement from 2,000 years prior. Excavation directors called it the Early Bronze Age New York. The founding of the city dramatically changed urbanization. Before this, people were just kind of living in primitive settlements of maybe a few dozen. But somewhere along the way, humans began concentrating in this one spot. It turned into a city over 160 acres, double the size of anything else in the region. There's almost nothing left of the megacity now, just ruins, scraps of pottery, burned animal bones from sacrifices, and broken statues. There were around 4 million fragments of artifacts found in total, with some of them even coming all the way from Egypt. This has led archaeologists to speculate that ancient Ancient New York may have been so impressive it drew settlers from faraway kingdoms. Who knew that 5,000 years ago people could be so organized? Ancient Egyptian Magic Medicine The ancient Egyptians were some of the first people to discover how to heal the sick using medicine. 5,000 years ago as well, they were the ones who started the concept of a healthy life. Some of the earliest records of medical practitioners come from ancient Egypt, and yet this society was unique in that they discovered how to use herbs for practical, natural medicine, while also employing their own breed of magic that probably didn't do much to heal anybody. Here's the thing about the ancient Egyptians. They believed gods and demons as well as spirits were behind diseases. They thought that spirits went into a person's body and affected the way it functioned. To get rid of these pesky spirits, medical doctors would use a combination of spirit spiritual prayers, and natural remedies. Back then, doctors were usually priests. But before the Egyptian civilization collapsed, they had in fact separated what were essentially spiritual healers from real medical practitioners. They were so good at what they did that people came from other empires just to get help from Egyptian doctors. There is a document which contains over 700 remedies and formulas. It was written by an Egyptian doctor in 1500 BC, called the Ebers Papyrus. The document details how doctors discovered that the heart is the supply of blood to the body, attached to vessels in every corner. They also described the characteristics of mental illness how to use birth control, how to fix dental issues, and even how to surgically remove an abscess and a tumor. A Dream of Atoms Akarya Kanada was born somewhere around the year 600 BC in eastern India. He was a natural scientist, a philosopher, and something of a genius. According to Indian legend, he came up with the theory of atoms 2,500 years before John Dalton's official discovery. He was the very first person to suggest that everything in the universe was made up of tiny atoms that are invisible to the human eye. The idea occurred to him one day as he was breaking a piece of bread into small pieces. At some point, he realized that he was unable to divide the food into smaller fragments. He had already broken the bread up into very tiny crumbs and started wondering at what point did something like a piece of bread become so small that it could no longer be divided. This became the idea of the particle, the smallest piece of matter that is indivisible. Of course, he had no way to prove his theory. All he could do was think about these tiny particles, so small the human eye can't see them. His reasoning behind his theory was that if you could break up a piece of bread into crumbs, those crumbs must break up into something that humans don't have the capacity to see. 
And he was right. But humans didn't collectively agree with him for another two and a half millennia. Pretty incredible, right? Despite not having access to the scientific instruments to prove his theories, this sage was thinking on a micro-scientific level. The Greek discovery of mermaids. The history of mainstream mermaids has been traced back to ancient Greece. I don't need to bother you with the details of what a mermaid is, but some of the earliest tales of mermaids come from Greek stories of dangerous monsters that were half woman, half bird. They lived on rocky crags on sea coasts and sang beautifully to seduce sailors. Sailors would become so enamored by the siren song that they steered their ships into the rocks and crashed. But these weren't actually the very first mermaid tales. The earliest known stories come from Assyria in 1000 BC. The Assyrians believed in a mermaid goddess named Atargatis. She accidentally killed her lover and jumped into a lake in shame, forever taking the form of a fish. But because she was so beautiful, she only became a fish from the waist down. She had a fish's tail and the beautiful upper body of a woman. So what does all this have to do with ancient discoveries? There are some who speculate that mermaids were once real, or at least some bizarre facsimile of mermaids. The coincidental telling of mermaid stories from Assyria to Greece and beyond suggests something fishy may have been seen by sailors. Even Roman historians, specifically Pliny the Elder, described mermaid sightings in the Mediterranean. So either the Assyrians were the first people to physically witness a real mermaid, or they were the first to come up with these stories of fish and human hybrids. Babylonian Ghosts A Babylonian tablet from 3500 years ago could contain the very first depiction of a ghost. The tablet was made in the year 1500 BC, give or take a few years. It depicts what appears to be a male ghost being brought back from the afterlife. This is according to British Museum curator Irving Finkel. If true, it could mean that while the Assyrians invented mermaids, the Babylonians invented ghosts. The stories we still cherish today may have been some of the first stories ever told. Irving Finkel believes the tablet holds detailed instructions on how to exercise a ghost. The directions explain how to transfer a spirit that's bothering you into an inanimate figurine. To get rid of a pesky ghost, simply make a figurine of the deceased man or a woman, prepare two vessels of beer, and call on the Mesopotamian god Shamash at sunrise. By saying the ritual words, the ghost will go into the figurine and leave you alone. The tablet also comes complete with a warning not to look behind you during the ritual, otherwise it won't work, and the ghost might get you instead. This is just one interpretation, and it hasn't been 100% verified. Irving believes the drawing was made by a master craftsman and kept in the library of an exorcist or in a temple to Shamash. But either way you look at it, this does seem to be the very first evidence of a human discovering a ghost. The Discovery of Gravity A man named Ramesh Pokhriyal, who happens to be the Minister for Human Resource Development in India, says everything you know about Isaac Newton is a lie. He claims that an Indian mathematician discovered gravity hundreds of years before Sir Isaac Newton. It's not that Newton was a fraud, but that someone else had actually beat him to it. This bizarre accusation involves several different people. The first Indian scientist to discuss the effects of gravity was Brahmagupta in the 7th century. He wrote in a historical text that the body will always fall towards the earth because it's the nature of the earth to attract bodies. Years later, around the year 1120, Indian astronomer Bhaskara II elaborated on this idea, discussing how all things seem to be attracted to the surface of the Earth. The issue here isn't exactly who discovered gravity first, but what the definition of a discovery is. Everyone who's ever been alive probably was aware that if you throw something in the air, it will come back down. This is general knowledge. Isaac Newton wasn't the first one to figure out that there was something keeping people from flying into space, but he was definitely the first one who was able to explain and spread his ideas in such a way that they became a common understanding. Space Auroras Auroras are some of the most beautiful natural occurrences that light up the night sky. But what we know of as the Aurora Borealis, or the Northern and Southern Lights, is actually a space phenomenon that is not unique to our planet. Auroras are also quite a bit more complicated than just pretty lights in the night sky. It starts with a stream of charged particles flowing out from our sun. This plasma is then deflected by the Earth's magnetic field. But the field acts kind of like a glove, snagging some of these plasma particles and pushing them along the magnetic field lines to the north and south poles. These particles then plunge into our atmosphere, colliding with the oxygen and nitrogen atoms. 
The collisions release energy in the form of light particles, also known as photons. And this is exactly what an aurora is – energy from the sun exploding in our atmosphere. Scientists have discovered auroras on several other planets. Saturn and Jupiter have auroras so powerful that they heat up their entire atmospheres. Some scientists believe this could be why the planets are so warm, even though they are so far from the sun. The heat that is generated because of all those energy particles getting stuck in the atmospheres keeps the temperature warm. In fact, two of Jupiter's moons also experience auroras. Europa and Ganymede have colorful auroras, and so too does Comet 67P slash Churyumov Gerasimenko. Comets are able to form auroras when they are stricken by solar wind molecules that get stuck in the shroud of gas surrounding the comet. Did you know that? Moon Cube Just a few weeks ago, scientists all over the world were talking about the mysterious hut that a Chinese rover discovered on the moon. It all happened when China's U-22 rover spotted the object on the horizon, looking like the ramshackle hut of some kind of moon hermit. Speculation exploded, with some suggesting it could be the leftover ruin of some unknown moon civilization. Some said it could be an alien base. People were going wild with excitement and theories abounded. The wait is finally over, and China's rover has finally reached the mysterious object. It's now being called a moon cube because it's nothing but a cube of rock. It took a few weeks of driving, but the rover is now close enough to see that the mysterious shack isn't so mysterious after all. It only looked so geometrically perfect from a distance because of light, perspective, and shadow. Now that the rover is close enough to see it in great detail, scientists say it looks more like a rabbit than a hut. It even has small rocks in front of it that look like pieces of a carrot. Scientists have named the rock U2, same as the rover, which is Chinese for Jade Rabbit. What was almost an alien outpost on the moon is really just a crumbling piece of debris in the shape of a fuzzy Earth animal. Strands of Mystery At the core of the Milky Way galaxy, there are a multitude of strange features. Scientists have identified somewhere around 1,000 mysterious magnetic strands hovering in the center of our galaxy that they can't understand. The cluster of strands, like galactic pieces of hair, stretch for over 150 light years in length. Each strand is spaced equally from the next, creating a bizarre structure many millions of years old and very strange. It almost looks like a massive harp with all of its strings neatly lined up. But the nature of the strands is a mystery. Professors of physics and astronomy at Northwestern University believe each strand is made up of cosmic ray electrons with magnetic fields moving at about the speed of light. But their origin is elusive. The radiation is unlike what's left behind after major cosmic events like a supernova. One of the more bizarre theories is that the strands of magnetic matter could be the final vestiges of activity of a supermassive black hole. In the end, we don't yet know what these things are, what created them, or what relevance they have in the universe. Scientists are still trying to figure out the mystery of the galactic center, where all kinds of strange phenomena have been documented in recent years. What do you think the magnetic strands could be? Tell me your theories in the comments! Aliens on Mars The Curiosity rover on Mars discovered a strange mixture of chemical elements that could point to the existence of alien life on the red planet. It's not a sure thing, but it does inspire some hope, if that's what you're into. The rover identified carbon in the sediment of the Gale crater during its travels there between August of 2012 and July of 2021. 24 powder samples were heated by the robot to separate each individual chemical. This revealed a variation of carbon-12 and carbon-13 isotopes. And if you know anything about the creation of life on our own planet, you'll know that carbon plays a key role. But the presence of the carbon may just be a coincidence. The carbon could have come from a molecular cloud of dust. Or it may have come from the conversion of CO2 to organic compounds through a process that has nothing to do with biology. It could have just been ultraviolet light and trace amounts of CO2. Or it could mean aliens. This last theory, and arguably the most interesting, is that microbes were converting methane through biological processes. This would mean life. What happened to that life, what it may have looked like, and how long it lasted before utter devastation is still a mystery. 
However, the samples of carbon-13 are almost identical to samples of carbon-13 found in Australia, from sediment over 2.7 billion years old. If there was life on Mars, it was probably a very, very long time ago. Weird Space Rock People often get confused between comets and asteroids. They are both celestial objects, they both hang out in space, and so it's not surprising that they seem so similar. But they are very different. Comets come from the outer solar system and have elliptical orbits. Comets are filled with ice that then sublimates as they get closer to the sun, creating a dusty atmosphere that looks like a blazing tail. On the other hand, asteroids are found in the main asteroid belt of our galaxy, between the planet Mars and Jupiter. Asteroids have orbits more closely resembling the orbits of planets. They also aren't formed of ice, but are basically giant rocks. Scientists have now discovered a fascinating mixture of both. It's called, are you ready for it? 248370-2005-QN173. I know, that's a terrible name for anything. But, you know, these are astronomers we're talking about, perhaps more focused on discovery than creative naming. The newly found space rock is a hybrid between a comet and an asteroid. It was found loitering in the asteroid belt, but it shows signs of outgassing as it gets near the sun. It also has the tail of a comet. Scientists have identified less than 10 of these strange hybrid objects. Henry Tsai of the Planetary Science Institute says 248370 is both an asteroid and a comet. It fits the physical definitions of a comet, but has the orbital pattern of an asteroid. It doesn't mean much in the grand scheme of things, but it's always fascinating when astronomers find new bodies out in space. Mystery Object Astronomers were mapping radio waves across the universe when they discovered a celestial object unlike anything humans have ever encountered before. This object is releasing massive bursts of energy every 18 minutes. When it was first discovered, astronomers were shocked to see that its beams of radiation three times an hour were the brightest source of radio waves in the sky. Whatever this object is, it seems to be acting like a celestial lighthouse. Astronomers haven't identified it, but say it might be the remnant of a collapsed star with a very powerful magnetic field. It could be a dead neutron star, or a dead white dwarf, or something completely different. According to the astrophysicists at the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research, the object appears and disappears every few hours. It's like a ghost, which is alarming because nothing else in the sky does that. And it's not even like it's too far away. The object is only 4,000 light-years from Earth, practically in our backyard. Some have begun speculating that it could be some kind of alien mothership sending out radio waves. We just don't know how to read them. And while that would be amazing, maybe, chances are it's probably just a dead star. The problem is that scientists can't quite figure out how to look at it yet. All they know is that this invisible thing is there, and it's beaming out a relentless signal. What do you think it could be? Are you hoping it's alien life? Let me know in the comments, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already for more videos about space and other discoveries. Fresh Plutonium Scientists have made a very strange discovery from space right here on planet Earth. By studying a piece of the Earth's crust, which was gathered from the very bottom of the Pacific Ocean, scientists could reveal some extraordinary insight into the universe at large. When researchers brought the piece of crust out from the ocean, they found traces of a very rare form of plutonium. You've probably heard of plutonium before in the context of nuclear bombs. This is no surprise, considering plutonium comes from a volatile space event. This particular form of plutonium was forged when two neutron stars smashed into each other. The collision was so intense and powerful that it created what we call plutonium, sending it drifting through the endless vacuum of space until it eventually fell to Earth. And here's what's really going to surprise you. Scientists believe all heavy elements come from space, all from the violent death of stars. This means gold, silver, uranium, platinum, and plutonium. All this stuff is the result of exploding supernovas thousands of light years away. The next time you wear a piece of gold around your neck or a ring on your finger, remember you are actually wearing alien jewelry. Weird Alien Worlds Since 2018, NASA has found over 5,000 alien worlds. Almost all of them are bizarre, but some are weirder than others. These worlds are referred to as exoplanets. 
Astronomers see them whenever they pass in front of bright stars and in the line of sight of a telescope. It sounds pretty basic, but scientists are able to find out a lot of information using this method. They can see the characteristics of exoplanets, like their size and shape, and sometimes even what they're made of. Let's take a look at some of the more outlandish planets found by NASA's Transitine Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. TOI-2109b orbits its star in only 16 hours and is only positioned 1.5 million miles away from it. To give you perspective, the Earth is 93 million miles from the Sun and orbits once a year. This proximity makes the temperature on TOI-2109b an outstanding 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Then there is GJ-367b, which orbits its sun in 8 hours and has a daytime temperature of 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Some of these planets are also way bigger than our own. TOI-1634b is rocky just like Earth, but with a radius over two times our own. Then there are planets like TOI-700d, which is positioned in the habitable zone of its star and only 100 light-years away. It's only a little bigger than Earth, about the same distance from its sun, and could even host life. The Accident The Accident is a strange cosmic object that got its name after being discovered completely by accident. Get it? Creative, I know. It is technically a brown dwarf. Yet it doesn't look anything like the over 2,000 brown dwarfs that astronomers have identified in our galaxy so far. Brown dwarfs form as if they will turn into stars, but never manage to generate enough mass to start a nuclear fusion. In other words, these are failed stars. In the case of the accident, it confused scientists because it appeared to be cold and old, but also extremely bright, as if it were hot. This is weird for a brown dwarf because when they're young, they get extremely hot, then cool down and get dim as they grow older, like a red-hot piece of metal being moved out of the fire. This brown dwarf is estimated at around 13 billion years old. That's over double the average age of all known brown dwarfs. It would have formed at the very beginning of the universe. What this suggests is that the brown dwarf was born at a time when the galaxy didn't have as much carbon in it as it does today. It was missing many of the molecules that we see in other brown dwarfs, leaving it uniquely bright as if still warm, yet undeniably cold and dead. Saturn's newest moon Saturn has enough moons to make every other planet in the galaxy jealous. And in 2013, astronomers identified yet another one. They called it Peggy. She was found hiding at the edge of Saturn's A-ring. The tiny moon is only 1.2 miles wide, making it barely more than a floating pebble in the grand scheme of space. But in 2014, astronomers couldn't find Peggy. She had vanished. Planetary scientist Carl Murray believed Peggy was either thrown into the void of space or smashed apart in a collision with another one of Saturn's moons. Then, in 2015, Peggy came back. She was still there in 2016, but not fully intact. The moon had hit something, scraping a big chunk out of it. That small chunk is now an even smaller, miniature moon called Peggy B. Scientists even think that Peggy may have been the result of something hitting something else and breaking apart, causing a huge chunk of rock to get caught up in the gravitational pull of Saturn. It's pretty amazing because these things happen all the time. Moons come and go, just not in a single person's lifetime. These things happen over millions and millions of years. So it was pretty spectacular that we were able to watch the birth of one of these celestial objects in real time. If Earth ever managed to get itself a second moon, what do you think we should call it? Let me know in the comments below. And thanks for watching! Be sure to subscribe for more awesome space videos, and I'll see you next time. Bye!